everybody, and welcome to our panel for today, Unshelving the Mysteries of Tabletop Games with Cobalt Press. Yes, we know that unshelving is not an actual word, but it was a cute pun for all you librarians out there in school. So here we are. Uh, Cobalt Press is a tabletop game publisher. We uh, specifically make 5th edition and 5th edition compatible products, meaning if you know Dungeons & Dragons, all of our books are compatible with Dungeons & Dragons. So everything that you're going to see today is already going to potentially be familiar to you or familiar to those that your organization serves. My name is Dot Steverson. I'm the marketing director for Cobalt Press. And... Hello, everybody. My name is T. Anton Stengren. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm the COO of Cobalt Press. We're really excited to be here. This is our first ALA. Uh, obviously, we're fans of both games and books, so maybe we're in the right place for this weekend. Uh, we want to kick off by asking just a couple questions. Raise your hand if you have heard of tabletop RPGs. Fantastic. Raise your hand if you have played a tabletop RPG. Okay, wonderful, love it. And raise your hand if you have absolutely no idea what a tabletop RPG is. Okay, well the good news is we didn't have any hands at the end. Uh, we are actually going to break some of this down for you today. So if this is really new to you, or all you've heard is Dungeons and Dragons on your favorite media on television, we are going to break this down step by step. And at the end, we're going to take your questions. So please feel free when we call for questions to step up to the mic at the back of the room. We will take those questions, and if you are unable to make it to that microphone, I am happy to come to you. Just raise your hand, and I'll bring this lovely mic over to you. So, we're going to start with a big question. What actually is a tabletop role-playing game? So, when we talk about a tabletop role-playing game, what we're talking about is a collaborative game. Not with a video game and not with a controller in hand. This is where characters, uh, players create fictional characters and embark on an adventure together. They tell a story using improv, math, dice, and a couple books. It's a pretty fun experience. It's one that takes us away from a screen and brings us back to a table together. The GM is the person that's gonna describe the imaginary world. They're gonna tell us all about the place in which these characters are adventuring and the story in which they're going to tell it in, the parameters we might call them. And then this imaginary world is gonna be inhabited not just by the characters the players create, but by everybody else. The people that works at the tavern and the local stores and your big bad guy that they may fight at the end. All of this comes together in an interaction with this environment that tackles challenges and they make decisions with their characters. about cooperative storytelling is it's not just about sort of saying what your character does. Um, there is an element of failure potential. You can't just say, I hit the dragon with the sword and the dragon explodes. Um, so anytime your character wants to do something where there is a potential for failure, we roll a dice, we add how well your character is at the thing you're specifically trying to do, be it unlock a door, climb a wall, and then we add it together and see whether or not you've met the, the target number or difficulty check to succeed. Depending on success or failure, the GM then will rates the next step. Alright. Okay, so, because you are all working for schools and organizations, oftentimes it's important to make a pitch. You're going to have to get funding to buy the books. you got to convince the parents and everybody in your community that this is something worth diving into. So it's important to understand that tabletop gaming is not just a game. It uses a lot of core skills that we teach uh, both in school and through the curriculums that your library and your schools may already uh, be moving forward, which includes teamwork and collaboration, reading comprehension, what we call quick math, critical thinking, improvisation, and creativity and storytelling. That means when you get ready to hopefully launch a game day, a game night, a new club, these are things that you can talk about. There is so much research out there of other teachers and other libraries that have actually done uh, uh, and pulled together statistics around uh, their findings and how it has actually elevated the student uh, experience. And one of those big ways are through these core skills. And one of the other things that we touch on is, is empathy. Because yes. you're, you are reacting as a fictional person to the environment around you. And how you do that and the often somebody said, 
my my tavern burnt down because X, Y, and Z, and you're then reacting to them. But it's also about um, sharing the spotlight with people. Uh, you can't have a table of lone wolves who want to be the primary character. This is a team exercise, so it's an ensemble cast. So again, getting people to share with others uh, is important. Yeah, and because of these core skills, oftentimes we find that students or uh, uh, people in your community that would often not come together can for this. You've got your math kid who just loves math and number crunching. You've got your improvisation for your theater kid or your band nerd, right? Uh, who can go play a bard and all the magical music that they want. This is an opportunity to reach out to all the corners of your organization and be able to bring students together that would often not be collaborative in a, a usual educational space. So let's talk about what you need to play. What do you actually need? What is our supply list, everybody, for the first day of school, okay? Uh, there are a couple things that you're absolutely going to need. You're going to need what we call core rule books. Regardless of whether you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, or you're playing our uh, version, uh, T uh, Tales of the Valiant, or something else out there, you gotta have the core rule books. These rule books help set into place the parameters in which the game is played. You're also going to need to figure out your adventure. You need some kind of outline story. Uh, even when we write our own stories, uh, text to page, you still have to have an idea of where that story is going. So there are gonna be some options, and we'll talk deeper about that, of ways to help you find the right adventures for your tables, your schools, and your organizations. Whether you write it yourself, or you seek out pre-written adventures which are out there and available to you. You're also going to need what we call a polyhedral set of dice. We're gonna actually break down some of the dice mystery here in just a second, but yes, you are going to need that dice, and not just what we call D6 Yahtzee dice, right? We're gonna need a whole bunch of various kinds of dice. You're gonna need printed character sheets. These are the sheets that the students use to actually outline that character, so they know who they're playing why this person is different from them, and where the motivation to make the decisions they're gonna make in collaborative gameplay come from. Pens and pencils, pretty simple. You also need some snacks because nobody wants to play on an empty stomach. It's a great thing for after school to just have some table snacks. And of course, there is the next step, which would be to add things like maps and miniatures to the table to really immerse everybody into the moment. Though that is optional. Speaking of dice, let's break this down. So what is the basic set of dice for RPGs. We call it a polyhedral set. It comes with seven dice. It comes with a D20, a D12, two D10s, a D8, a D6, and a D4. You can actually see this dice down here. When we say D number, what I mean is D stands for dice, dice. The number stands for how many sides that dice has. Is it a 20-sided dice? Is it a 12-sided dice, a four-sided dice? For our D10s, we get two kinds of dice. We get one through 10, but then we also have one that has double digits. 10, 20, 30, 40, we call this a percentile because it helps us do percentiles uh, by rolling a dice. This is basically all they need dice-wise to play. For Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the D20 is the core dice, meaning that's gonna usually be the first thing you roll, and the rest of the polyhedrals will then come into play later on if they want to do something special, or maybe their super duper magic ice missile uh, does a D4 damage, right? So you're gonna need some dice. Dice can be purchased very inexpensively from a variety of places. We have dice on our website, which we'll talk about later in ways you can get discounts on our product, but dice, polyhedral dice are really not hard to find. You can even buy them in like bulk 100 bags from Amazon. I'm just going to mention the D20. Um, you, Dungeon Dragons and Tales of the Valiant, similar systems are often referred to as D20 systems. And the reason for that is that 20-sided dice is the dice that most rolled. Anytime you make a skill check, anytime you make an attack roll, anytime you make a saving throw against a dragon's breath, you roll the D20 and add them. So. Let's talk about some of these other things on that supply list we were talking about, so I can put images to those words. So here on the, uh, your right, you will see a character sheet. A character sheet is often one, two, three, or four pages, and it's gonna, like I said, lay out all those stats. It looks intimidating, it's not, I promise. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But this is what the character sheet looks like. It's gonna give us the numbers needed to roll that D20 and add the skill. 
On the far left on the screen, you're going to see maps and minis. Uh, over at our booth, number 222, you can actually come see these in scale size. We have large scale maps and what we call small tile maps, which are very, very helpful for what you all will be doing, which is often setting up and breaking down at the end of the day. Minis and maps are completely optional. Games can absolutely be played in what we call theater of the mind. And often that's the best way to start because a lot of people will get caught up in that map and that mini and miss the storytelling piece of it because now it feels like we're playing a board game. So often we say, start without, give it a go, and then slowly add in new options to the table as you get the funding that you need or you feel that the people that you're playing with are moving out of a novice state and into a more intermediate gameplay. Now you'll see from that uh, character sheet, there's lots of little boxes, and at first glance it looks quite complicated, but we really simplified the sheet down. It is as clear as you can. So there is a box that says, how good is your ability to climb? And then you put a number next to it. Two um, to four, or two to six. Yeah, so it is uh, specifically been done, and we've actually had uh, people look at this uh, from a cognitive point of view about how people take in information, uh, and what's important to them, and done graphic design to actually pull out the most important pieces, which are those sort of like light bulb shapes, to again make it easier for players to go, which are the bits that I need to know primarily and then secondarily. Correct. Thank you, Alexander. So, let's actually talk about our GMs for a second. It's a game master. That's what I mean when I say GM. This is the person that is kind of like in the narrator. They've built the adventure or the world, and they are oftentimes the hardest to find. This is somebody that really needs to understand the mechanics to some degree, and they really need to have a passion for not wanting to just play one character, because guess what? They have to play every other character in the whole world uh, that, that they're gonna be gaming in. This is somebody that really needs to want to take the step, and more often than not for your clubs, it's going to potentially be you or whoever is running that gaming club to start. But they're out there, and oftentimes players that start will eventually say, I want to do that. I want to GM. I've been inspired by you or by this experience, and they will step into that role. The most important thing to know is that even though GMs are the hardest to find, there's a lot of tools out there for them to help them step into that role. Not only the core rule books, but pre-written adventures. I said this earlier. These are creatives that have already gone out there and done the hard work for you. They have gathered the monster stat block and the outline of the adventure. And they're not writing this with the expectation that the players are going to make specific decisions because I will tell you, they're not. They're going to make the decision that you least expect. Uh, so these adventures are written to accommodate that kind of open, improvised gameplay. Uh, we have a, actually a book at our booth, which again, you are welcome to come check out. That is a series of what we call quick one-shot adventures. Three pages, set up, map, bad guy is basically the be all end all. And this is a great place to start. Do not feel like you need to run a Game of Thrones level story to begin your club. Sometimes it is okay to begin in a test place. Uh, start them with something small and work up from there. But these pre-written adventures are available all over the internet by uh, freelance writers, maybe even writers that you know, as well as companies and publishers like us that specialize in writing things for a generalized audience. Now, as for our players, they don't get off the hook either. They have some prep to do as well, some homework before they show up to the table. They've got to figure out who they're playing. They've got to know to their core that this is the character that they're showing up with. So this is gonna be part of their homework out of the core rule book to get that player sheet together. It means that they are going to have to uh, look at these core rule books, learn the same mechanics the GM needs to, and begin to uh, access their creative mind to decide who this character and world is. Maybe it's all completely opposite of them, or maybe it's a fantasy representation of a part of themselves. All of this is acceptable, and in this case, most books are going to accommodate creative build of character. As we do that, note that some people are gonna get overwhelmed with the character building process. You saw the character sheet, and I saw a couple of your eyes widen a little bit, that's okay. Out there, there are pre-generated characters. In fact, Cobalt Press makes quite a few of them at a variety of levels from one, two, three, and four. And these are easily downloadable and easy to hand out to people that just want to test, that aren't ready to take the deep dive into creating, uh, going through the intense character building process. 
So know that there, again, just like for GMs, are pre-prepped materials that are good and easy for you to use uh, that will help take work off of you and the people showing up to your game days or nights. And a lot of our pre-written adventures are designed specifically to use this power level of pre-generated characters, so you know that you can put them down the table and just run into it straight away. Now, this is where I want you to not panic about the character sheet, because in our newest book, Tales of the Valiant, which again we'll get into in a second, we have actually broken down in a nice key how to use these character sheets. Again, we've done a lot of research on the process of which uh, the, co the brain works and the cognitive piece of how best to lay things out. And so even in our book, we have a step-by-step. -step. We have numbered it for you. We have broken it down. We've explained each section to you so that there is very little question. But these are what the character sheets will look like, of course, uh, these two small examples down here. Um, and they will need that character sheet each session. So it is up to you as the club. Are you going to collect them so they don't lose them? Are you just going to laminate them and have them at the library? But the, they're going to need to come back each and every time. So something to really think about it is a, it is a, 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 an iconic item that these uh, players are going to need if they're planned to sit at the table and play the character. It needs to come back each and every time. And one of the only reasons for that is not just that you need to play that individual game. Uh, Tales of the Valiant is a story of character progression. So as you play more sessions, the characters will get more powerful, they will get more abilities, and those will then be further recorded on the character. Right. Who knows? You might get a magical item that needs to be recorded, or you may have some somebody that goes from being a peasant to a lord, because that's part of the story that you told. All of that will be recorded on a character sheet, so you actually see growth progression of a character from their wee baby level one to what does a fourth level character look like. This is part of that storytelling. Ready? All right, so let's actually talk about what is in the book, step by step, okay? I can give you all the supply lists we want, but we know until you start teaching curriculum in a classroom, none of it matters, right? We don't know how that class is gonna come out. It's the same thing with your game notes. So, here's the part where we kind of break it down for you. So, step number one is going to be to have what we call, in the gaming industry, a session zero. A session zero happens before you ever roll a dice. This is the chance for the game master and the players to come together and make kind of a verbal contract. Where are the lines at our table? Is this a PG-13 game or a PG game? What is off limits? Where are our fears and the things that we don't want brought into this? Those discussions need to happen. Uh, and we call that discussion safety tools. It is a way to make the table safe for everybody playing. And more and more now, it is becoming a pretty big standard in tabletop role playing that a session zero will discuss an option for safety tools. And I'm gonna give you all some information about where you can find those safety tools here uh, at the end. And then the session zero will also be the point at which the GM is gonna say, I've developed this amazing adventure and it's gonna be all about dungeons and diving into caverns and finding lost treasure, that information cues the characters in, or the players in, to what kind of character they might want to build. And this session zero will also be the space for the GM and the players to build those characters together. They don't have to do it alone. In fact, it's a lot more helpful to sit together and get your questions answered than going off by yourself and digging through a book. Because otherwise you'll end up with an entire table of lone wolves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll end up with a table of lone wolves. This is a great chance for everybody to be like, oh, you're playing the fighter? Well, maybe I want to play the bard. Or maybe I want to play the wizard. It's a way to balance and give everybody the chance to have something unique while building together towards a, a, an end. Once you have had your session zero, the GM's got the prep done, the character sheets are super duper ready, everyone is going to gather around a table just like you'd play any other board game, which means your library, school club, or organization is gonna need to have the space for this. You're gonna need to have tables available, chairs available. Things like lunchrooms are great, libraries often have different sections of tables that can make it really great um, kind of private space. The most important thing is the more tables that you have going for your game club, the more space you're going to need, because you don't want to put them on top of each other, it's gonna get real, real loud. Think about trying to play an intimate game in a setting with a lot of noise. So really consider how important the space is gonna be and the table at which you play at. Now it's time for gameplay. 
before the GM dives in and gives us all the nitty gritty details about this amazing world and the things they created and where we're starting, we gotta know who these players are. So give your players a chance to introduce themselves in character. What do I look like? What is my most defining feature? Do I have a funny accent? Or is my hair really unique? Do I carry a specialized weapon? Maybe as a wizard, it's my book. Or am I familiar? The dragon, that's the tiny dragon that sits on my shoulder. Whatever their imaginations come up with, they're gonna wanna share it and give them the space to do that. It is really the first step of them buying into their character and becoming that character at the table. When we say getting to character, there's no wrong way to do this. I have a player who I played with for five years. He never says anything first person. The player describes in the third person what his character is doing and the general idea of what he's going to be saying to a character. But he's never in the moment. And that's just how he plays. And that's fine. And then I have other players who will do the full silly voice. And that's also fine. And the full silly voice talk in first person, we often call this role playing. When a first person, a character in first person talks to another character in first person. It's improv. It's just improv. Now, the game master then, after having a general idea of these characters, maybe where they're coming from, why they're coming together as a group, now the game master gets their moment to set us up. This is the why. This is our inciting incident. This is why this whole story is going to matter. You gotta give the details of the world, but also maybe it's just that they meet at a tavern. Pretty standard setup. Why does this tavern matter? Or why does this incident that kicks off their journey matter? And as the game progresses, as we talked about, the players will begin making decisions. So Alexander, I want to show them kind of maybe how this works. What's your favorite character you've ever played? Uh, I would say Verena Philanthropina. Okay, great. I'm not going to repeat that uh, because I'm going to totally botch it. But this is your character. Can you give them the 10 second rundown? Yes. Uh, she is a 18 year old woman, uh, the daughter of noble, effectively, Egyptologists. Uh, she, uh, something terrible happened when they were on a dig as a small child, um, had a cognitive uh, break as she watched her parents being murdered by terrible mummies and things. She's now. So this is a happy story. Oh, no, it's often happy stories. Um, she's effectively a six year old girl. Um, but she's one of the greatest sages in all the world and has terrifying powers from a patron, but is still a creepy little girl. And so you're saying she has magical abilities, she magical, has magical abilities, And she has a, a little familiar, it's called um, Mr. Snuggles, and it's this awful teddy bear that she talks to, and he responds, he's the bad guy. So he tells her to do things, and she's like, Okay. So I'm going to say uh, you and Mr. Snuggles have shown up uh, in, in a cave. You're looking for a magical item. And as a GM, I might say, say something like, you walk into this cavern. You can hear the ceilings dripping with water, smell a vile thing on the air, taste the rocks on your tongue. And in front of you sits a chest. Maybe this holds the magical item you're looking for. What do you do? So my character uh, is... You know when you get a small child and they just go and boop all the things near them? That's basically it. I have no filter. It's just it. So if I see a chest, it is immediately run over, start rattling it, try and open it. Often while the rest of the party is screaming, no, Verena, stop. And that's probably what happens. The rest of the party is like, no, don't. And so your action is to run over and just begin shaking it. Yes. You try to open it? Yes. To your luck, it is not locked, which means it's probably a trap. As you open that chest, it explodes outward with ice magic, uh, layering this whole section of the cave in ice and magical crystals, and blows you backwards. I'm gonna have you make a check. This is where we start rolling dice. In the moment in which the stakes are highest, we begin rolling dice. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna have you roll an athletics check. You're going to roll your d20. You're going to add whatever her athletics uh, uh, modifier is, which would be on that character sheet. Which is going to be terrible. Which is going to be terrible because, you know, uh, so maybe it is terrible. Um, and I, as the GM, will have a plan for an outcome. I know that she's going to be able to dodge it as long as she rolls a 12. But if she rolls under a 12, there might be consequences. And then the whole process starts over again. 
and you can see how this collaborative storytelling works. The GM will call for a role, the players will make a decision based on what their character would do, yes. not Alexander, because I know he would not run up and open a random chest. I knew him too often. Well <laughs> <laughs> right? So you want, to, uh, you want to continue this process over and over. So the dice will get rolled to determine the outcome of that action, and the game master then will res describe the results. So I'm going to give it to you and say you rolled a 13, just over. Congratulations. As soon as you open it, your extreme cognitive abilities knew it was coming, and you were able to roll to the side and dodge out of the way because of your athletics just in time. But unfortunately, it was so close that Mr. Snuggles took an icicle right through his little fluffy chest. Set the stakes again for the character. And then I will present the next challenge, which is what are we going to do about Mr. Fluffy, who now has an icicle through his teddy bear chest, okay? And that develop, it will develop, and the adventure continues to unfold. That is the basics, start to finish. Now, it's not always going to play out that clean, right? Because you might not be the only character that wants to run up and open the chest. The rogue may say, I want to I lock pick it. Or the barbarian may say, I'm going to smash it. So you may have a lot of voices at the table. It is the game master's job to give space to each of them and find a way narratively to move us forward. Next slide. Come on. Oh, we had, okay, perfect. So now is where we talk a little bit about the products we actually have. You have a somewhat 101 level understanding of what a tabletop is and how it will play out, but we want to give you some resources if you want to bring that to your organization. So. We have just come out with our new book, and this is where I'm going to pass it off to Alexander. I will eat that back. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. So uh, we have now produced a game that's just come out. The July 17th it hits uh, retail stores. It's called Tales of the Valiant. Uh, this is an extension of the fifth edition uh, rules uh, using their Creative Commons and SRD. We've basically taken their core rules and given it to a specific cobble press. And by they, you mean? Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons. The, the biggest tabletop yeah. we all know. So we've taken all the classes, and because this game was produced 10 years ago, and a lot of stuff needed a bit of a punch up, it needed a little bit of love and care, and that's what we spent a huge amount of time doing. Uh, we fixed the ranger, it's now fun to play. Um, so, but we've also taken all of the monsters of the SRD, and we've uh, purchased new arts and new graphics, and presented that information in a new way, and releasing this. So. It is 5th edition compatible, so you don't have to throw away those old books. This can still work with this, but this is a perfect starting point for new players. That's right, and for any, anybody that's like, but Tales of the Valiant isn't D&D. Yes, it is. Yes. So for those players that already have some knowledge of that, or those people that want to participate, that really want to play D&D, please remind them, this really is D&D. And one of the things that Cobalt Press prides itself in is making um, work that is no... Uh, I guess you could say no more adult than PG-13. Yes. So all of our products coming out for Tales of the Valiant are meant for students, families, as well as the more advanced gamer that may be looking for a, a more violent experience. Uh, but our books are going to be the most family friendly that you can find. Yep. And that is a deliberate design choice for the company. So you won't have to worry from one product to the next that that rating will change. Correct. So Tales of the Valiant is a two, core, two book core system. That is all you need to start playing. We have the player's guide, which is the how to play the game, how to build a character, how to run a game, because the game master is also a player. And because there are monsters in the world, and there are dragons, and beholders, and owlbears, oh my, uh, we have a monster board, uh, with beautiful art of various gribbles and nasties with which to face. And I think actually the next one will show you a little bit about what these books look like. Now, we've got a little bit of yellow on the screen. Um, one of the things that we will do, Cobalt Press, is you can do direct sales through us on our web store. And if you register a library or school account, we will apply a flat discount on every single title that we stock. It is a 35% discount off MSRP. So here's the book, uh, just so you get an idea of what you're looking at kind of inside. This is the player's guide. It is going to have everything that both your players and your GM will need. The Monster Vault is just the, the icing on the cake. This is the cake. All the base classes, all the magic that you could possibly imagine, all the rules questions uh, that you're going to face, and everything that needs to go on a character sheet is gonna be within these pages. And this includes everything from the people that you will be, be it dwarves or elves or bear folk, 
uh, the classes that you'll be? Are you a stalwart fighter? Are you a paladin bringing down the power of your god? A wizard with an ancient grimoire? All the spells that you will need, and then all of the pieces of equipment like armor and swords and axes with which to fight those monsters. Correct, because we're not going to leave it on you to make all that up. We put it all in there for you, so there's zero question. Now, for the other book, The Monster Vault, um, I would say The Monster Vault is necessary when you're ready for it. You only need the player's guide uh, to begin as a GM to get the rules and a player to begin building. But the Monster Vault is going to have some key beautiful art, inspiration for the worlds and adventures that you build, and potentially the adversaries that they're going to face along the way. It's been organized by level. So if you have wee baby level 1 characters coming in, you're not throwing a level 20 or a CR 20 dragon at them because that's a fast way to kill everybody at the table. Uh, so we have organized it so you can easily find the things that are right for where you're at at the table with your players. So we produce those books, we produce a series of adventures and campaign settings and lots of titles. We've been in business a long time, we have quite a long uh, back years. history. There's a couple, there's a line that I want to talk to you about specifically because of the environment you work in. So these are the Cobalt Guide series. Uh, if you've ever been to a convention and sat on a panel and listened to somebody talk about anything, that's basically what these are. There's a series of 10 or 12 little TED Talks, little essays in a book. Uh, each of the Cobalt Guides is based on a specific theme. Uh, so here we have world building, we have role playing, and we have game mastery. Now, several of our Cobalt Guides are actually on academic, university academic reading lists. Um, so, world building is one for creative writing programs or game design programs. We are one of the only companies that actually, I think we are the only company that produces this sort of meta-narrative. Yes, we are talking about 5th edition in our main game books, but these are not game-specific and they're not system-specific. Correct. So, regardless if you were playing D&D &D or maybe you decide on a sci-fi, tabletop game because that's what your players want, all of this will be relevant. They're written by um, the best of the best in the gaming industry, entertainment, and creative writing. We've had people like Gail Simone write on these. Uh, big uh, Veronica there. Roth from the Veronica Dungeons Roth has written on them. So what we do is we don't just go to game designers. We're going out to the people who are writing creatively about world building in a variety of ways. And then we say, how does this relate to tabletop? And potentially even bigger. So the main thing that we're showcasing uh, here is our new game night package. So a lot of people just don't know where to start. So we're producing uh, a website and a series of tools. This will be assets of how to start, what are safety tools, how to use them, um, why is role playing important, a lot of the stuff that we've covered here, but also downloadable character sheets, downloadable adventures, maps. I would love you to buy my entire back catalog, but this covers any sort of game night that you're looking to run the or games or other role playing systems. Yep, and that QR is live. You're welcome to go ahead and do it. If you drop by the Cobalt Press booth, we can also boop your badge, uh, and then we will be resending this information out to whatever email address you give us with some more things. The reminders about the 35% discount, which does go for all of our products, not just the Tales of the Value books, including the guides, if you're ready to put those into some kind of curriculum or bring them to your libraries, we're happy to do that. Uh, this library game night page has been put together to help you, to lead you on the path from the start, which we know is gonna be the pitch you have to do to get your funding and your money, or to bring the club together with the school, all the way down to the end of where we begin, where you actually begin gaming. As Alexander said, there are already resources there, free safety tools, free character sheets, all kinds of free things where if you're not ready to dive into the book, they're available for you now to start. Okay, so now we have 18 minutes for oh, questions. Oh, I was just on time. I wanted 20 minutes for questions. So this is the point where we start yakking for a second and give you a chance to ask questions. If you have one, there's a mic at the back or I'm happy to bring the one I'm talking on to you so we can get your questions answered. And it is important to say there are no silly questions. I know a lot of people, this is the first you've heard of a lot of TRPG, so um, yes, ask away. How does it end? It never does. That's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, obviously things do have to end, but just like any book, some books end open-ended, or maybe not always with a happy ending. And I think when we talk about story, an ending is important, and so that comes, maybe it's when the bad guy is defeated, that's the end of the story, and maybe we roll into a new one with the same characters. Um, or maybe the outcome is that they don't make it out of that cave with that treasure chest that exploded. Or maybe it is uh, even more open-ended. You get to the end and you beat the adversary only to realize that he's working for another big bad guy. 
So at, at the end of every session, I as a GM like to leave them on what I call a cliffhanger. If you think about how TV is made, TV is made to keep us coming back every week unlike a movie which has a more definitive ending. And I think this is a really smart way to think about your, your adventures and how you're running your tables. Are you running it like a movie? Or are you running it like a TV series? So a one-shot is effectively the Monster of the Week episode yeah, in Monster that series. Yeah, Monster of the Week is a great like. way to put it. So be it Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Supernatural or anything like that. So you have that self-contained, it doesn't affect the meta-narrative. But then you have the season arc be it 23 episodes, 23 sessions, however you want to run it, and you want a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. The main thing, and don't cover this, is not to go too hard, too fast. Feel free to play those one little ones. It's, don't start with Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you don't have to start that big. I mean, I think Buffy is a great example, right? When the whole first season of Buffy was just like, she defeated the monster and her friends every episode. Until we start to get into season two and three, and now we really understand who these characters are, and we can build into a larger arc where now Buffy is dealing with bigger problems that aren't just the monster of the week issue. These are things that really the game master will have to feel out at the table. What are the players interested in? Are they more drawn to player of the week? Or are they so dedicated to the characters they're kind of wanting a bigger arc? Uh, these things are uh, part of the planning process and part of the listening process at the table each time you gather. Great question, great question. Uh, more questions? Other questions? I know there's at least a couple. No? I mean, and like you said, no stupid questions. No. Well, I have a feeling that maybe some of you want to roll some dice with us. We are going to be doing demos here this weekend. We're going to put all of these words and everything I had into this uh, presentation in action for you. Uh, in a safe way where it's all ready, set to go, all you have to do is show up. And actually, our first demo is today at 3 o'clock. Uh, in the demo space, uh, where... Uh, I think the gaming pavilion is... Gaming pavilion, just, that's, that's the word yeah, I needed. Yeah. yeah, so in the gaming pavilion, you'll see us what we set up. We're going to do these in about 45 minutes, which is not the average game time. An average game is probably going to take you more like two or three hours with your kids, or uh, the community in which you're playing with. Uh, but we're going to do a very uh, quick and dirty 45-minute look, covering the three major aspects that you will encounter, or that you will face when you're gaming, right? Combat encounter social encounter because we don't solve every problem with steel and might, right? So what does a social encounter look like? As well as, we had another exploration. Oh, an exploration, because sometimes what you're trying to defeat is not a person, but the chest, right? Uh, so we're gonna give you a little intro to each of those, show you how we set it up, and what it's like to play as a level one character fighting a wee baby monster uh, to start uh, and get you rolling dice. But not dice. a baby monster. But not a baby. baby. He's not a baby monster. He's just a wee monster. I should say wee monster, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you roll some dice, really get your hands around it, and see how that character sheet plays out in all those core skills we were talking about, from problem solving to, to math. Uh, and uh, yeah, we hope you'll come and play with us. Uh, that's what gaming is. It means nothing if we're not collaboratively sharing the table. If you decide you do have some questions, please come to the booth. We are at booth 222. Uh, we've got a selection of products there for you to have a look. We spend a lot of time and money on our art. It's beautiful. Come and have a look at our books. Actually, all the art you saw in this presentation is from our books. Yep. Every, every ounce of it. Uh, as well as we have a small but fierce ribbon. And I know some of you are I know, I know you all are like me. You're small but fierce. Uh, this is our kind of motto for the company. We are a small but fierce company and we, we, we like to make small but fierce products. Uh, so please drop by, come get a ribbon. Uh, join us in the small but fierce parade. Otherwise, oh no, we have one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the sweet spot for how many players to have? Great the, question. So, the, many, what's the sweet spot for how many players to have? Um, it partly depends on what kind of campaign you're running, whether or not it's a combat heavy or whether it's a more narrative discussion one. Um, four to six, I would normally advise. Yeah. Uh, any more than six, and it gets very unwieldy. You yeah. have to use extra special skills to do it, and with potentially teenagers as well, <laughs> you don't want more than six of them. For the, for the clubs I've run from middle school and high school age, it tends to be about four. They've got big personalities, they have big wants, and when we're talking about not becoming the, the main character of their own story, to really own collaborative, somewhere between four and five is key. But on the library game night page, we'll kind of outline that for you. Technically, you can probably play safely with as little as three players and a GM, so four people at the table, but you really don't want more than six character voices. Because think about the setup that I just gave you with the one chest in the room, 
all six of them are going to want to do something different. And that's where chaos begins to ensue. So really think about maybe if you have one big personality, you don't put it at the table with other big personalities. Part of the curation process of your tables can be how do we get like-minded people, a good balance, but you also don't want to put the shyest person with the loudest person in the room because it's a fast way to get them overshadowed. Kind of an advanced question, but if I want to play uh, Tales of the Valley and Roll Twenty. So tells so. There are things called VTTs, virtual tabletops. It's not just pen and paper. Uh, with the pandemic, a huge number of these digital platforms uh, came up. Uh, Cobalt Press is on, I think, seven different VTT platforms. So we've got Roll Twenty, Fancy Ground, Shard, Mirrorscape, Alchemy, Foundry, and some other stuff. Tales of the Valiant is coming to Roll20. Uh, in fact, I believe the only VTT platform that's currently supporting all of our books that isn't doing Tales of the Valiant is Fantasy Grounds, but otherwise it'll be on all of the rest of it. So to make that clear for those of you who are like, virtual tabletop, what? The pandemic was obviously a time for all of us, and a lot of people picked up tabletop, but we were not actually able to sit at a physical table. So what VTTs do, or virtual tabletops, is they create a digital table space where you can use things like Zoom to support it. It does digital dice rolling. It's often a great way for your organizations if you're dealing with accessibility, especially the elderly who can't get out as well, but maybe have a computer at home. These are great ways to... Um, to continue to access various means of the community. I know that I play actually more games online now than I play in person because it's simply easier. So maybe consider if you are gonna be doing game nights, what does maybe a digital option look like for you? And I'll be honest, sometimes digital gameplay simply is we open up a Zoom call or a Google Meets and we still roll what we call IRL or in-person real dice at the table and we just share a digital space. There are a lot of options to support this and now I kind of want to build out a new section on the library game night page about VTTs. I'm going to make a note about that. I'll get that uh, done for all of you. Great question. So um, as your players become more experienced and want to do more, uh, companies like ourselves do run digital games through our Discord server as yep. well, VT. So there are lots of places that you can play games online, yes. uh, not just on the table. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Great. Uh, the only other thing I think I mentioned before we close out today is um, how to engage people at the table. And I didn't necessarily make a slide for this because there's a lot of theory around this, right? You can read tons of book about engagement uh, when you're not using digital screens and stuff. But there are some important pieces to tabletop that are often missed or we don't learn until it's too late. We learn them hands on. So the first one is, uh, as I was talking about earlier, the mixture of players at the table. We're all gonna get the shy people. We're gonna get the people who are not ready to come out and improvise. That's okay. He said his friend never talks in first person. He just tells you what that character would say. There should be no requirement that role play has to happen. Instead, I encourage you to think about ways that you can uh, uplift those that are not as comfortable with it. So I find when I have a really shy player at the table or a player that is being overshadowed by the louder voices in the room, I will often not ask, what do you do or what do you say? I will say, how is your character feeling? How is your character feeling in this moment? And often, pulling them outside the character, not in a first person voice, to say, my character's feeling kind of chaotic right now with everybody shouting over who's gonna open the chest, will actually inform the louder people at the table of how to include them. Not everybody is gonna think first person. We know that from just basic learning, cognitive learning. Everybody learns differently. Some of it's tactile, Right? So you have to think about the variety of players. The other thing that I do, and I did this when I gave the demo for Alexander's uh, <laughs> chest opening. When the GM describes things, hit all five senses. There's a basic, easy way to make sure that you describe a space or the next phase of the adventure in a way that everybody can access. What do you hear? What do you see? Do you taste anything on the air? What do you physically, right, hit all five senses. And this is gonna help set the table up for success because more than likely, each player is gonna connect to a different thing. If you only say it's low light in the room, well now everybody wants to make a perception check. But if I give them five senses in the room, somebody may attach to, well, why is there a nasty taste on the air? 
if it's low, like now somebody wants to do a perception, it gives everybody an opportunity to choose something different because there's nothing worse than us all having to make the same role at the table and then feeling like we didn't get that moment to shine. Other questions? All right, Woo, I think we did it. So please, please feel free to join us for a demo. We've got one today and two tomorrow. Alexander and I will be running some as well as our uh, assistant Will. So please drop by, you're gonna get to see minis and maps character sheet. We've got dice for you. All you got to do is show up and have an open mind. Thank you everybody so much. Thank you very we much. appreciate it.